welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you are new. Today, we're going to take a stroll through some small towns and rural areas to see what spookiness awaits us. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, whether it's a small town story or something different, be sure to submit it at swampdwell.net, or you can find the link in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here. Stories like yours will help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you haven't yet, be sure to slap that like button like it owes you money. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes the episode to fresh new eyes and helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. What are you waiting for? If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss any. I upload multiple videos a week covering all things natural and supernatural. Now, without further ado, let's jump right into these creepy and allegedly true small town horror stories that'll freak you out. Tonight, we delve into West Virginia spookiness by Banna B. A neighbor of mine told me a story of how his great-great-grandparents got together. This story won't contain a lot of emotion since I wasn't there. This isn't my family to get really worked up over, nor did I get many details. My friend is a pretty straightforward guy. Jim and May Hatt were his grandparents' names. They lived in a small West Virginia town in the early 1900s and late 1800s. Come to think of it, it was so small that over the years, that so-called town has been claimed by the town that was actually next to it. And now, it no longer exists. The population is declining. Jim came from a wealthy family who owned almost every logging company in northern West Virginia. His family owned nearly half the state, really. Considering his name was Hatfield. I would assume that he is related to the infamous Hatfield family, known for their feud with the McCoys. However, it was never stated or confirmed that this was true. It was just an assumption. May lived in a coal mining camp with her five siblings, her mother and father. So May didn't come from a wealthy family by any means. Back then, wasn't such a thing as being rich. Everywhere was. You see, Jim didn't want to go into the family logging business, so he went underground to mine coal with a couple of friends he grew up with, and he happened to work with May's father. After working for a couple of weeks, Jim asked May's father if he could start dating his daughter. May's father agreed and Jim took May on a series of dates over a few months. One day, Jim took May to a dance, followed by dinner, and their date ended with them at a local bar. Jim got super drunk over the evening, to the point he couldn't stand and was slurring his words. He asked May to drive him home. This is when the story takes a truly strange turn. On the way home, a man walked right in front of May's car and she couldn't hit the brakes fast enough. Jim told May to move over into the passenger seat. He got up, picked up the lifeless body off the road, and put it in the back of his vehicle. Jim then drove down a dirt road until they reached a dead end. I know what you're thinking. Jim was just slurring his words and trying to get the now convincingly dead person to drive straight. Well, I don't think he ever hit the person with the car, but I would assume that adrenaline was enough to knock him over. When they got to the dead end, Jim told May she needed to follow him up to the mountain, and he had a plan. When they finally got to the top of the mountain, there was a beautiful, hand-built cabin that Jim's parents owned when they lived in southern West Virginia. Jim told May she needed to stay there for a couple of weeks. You see, 
Jim held the 1909 Black Ford Model T, and he was only one of five people to own a car in the whole county. So, eventually, people would notice this man was missing. And if there was any piece of the vehicle on the road from the accident, fingers would start pointing. If the other people who owned vehicles had alibis, then it would come back that May was driving Jim since he was drunk, and she would be charged with murder. Dramatic, I know, but that's what Jim told me. And who knows, maybe he was right. I have watched many crime shows, and they don't normally back up this type of plan. It is a very grave type, if you ask me. But whatever May agreed to, a letter, not only to her, but also to Jim, which made people think he didn't know where she was. So, anyway, in the letter, she said that she was accompanying one of her friends to Tennessee to visit her family. Her friend didn't want to travel alone, so she wouldn't be back until some time, making sure her parents wouldn't question or even have any doubts. But well, it was a different time, I guess. I'm sure they didn't care or were too busy. This is where details do get a bit fuzzy, so use your imagination. Over time, Jim brought fabric chickens and even a cow up to the top of his mountain. It was also rumored that Jim would stay the night with May at the cabin, even though that was a big no-no back in the day. But I'm sure it was probably just a slumber party. Jim then told May, that there was to be no talk of the dead man that Jim buried, and she was safe to come back home when she did. Jim asked for her hand in marriage, which she accepted, and moved back up to the top of the mountain in that log cabin, since she had everything up there she now needed, and she liked it up there. She felt like the queen of the hill. May found out she was pregnant soon after that and they married. One day, she went to a local doctor for a checkup and saw the man whom she didn't kill with the car. When she got back home, she asked Jim about it because she thought he was dead, considering Jim told her he had buried that man. There was talk around the town. That's why she was hiding for so long. Buckle up, here's where it gets crazy. Jim told her he was just testing her he planted a man in the road, and instead of hitting the man, they drove through a big rock made of glass, brake metal, and crumbled stuff. In a state of shock, May didn't even notice or ask any questions about the accident. Jim said that since she came from money, he wanted a true, honest woman who could cook, clean, love him, etc. Compared to others, just using him for money. And if he found that woman, he would definitely marry her. Well, I guess that was some sort of romance because they've been married for 56 years and had 12 children. Being tricked into thinking she killed a man so someone could isolate her just as their shawl marriage was classified as romance. And I'm glad romance is dead. Isolation isn't always safe. Now let's move on to another story. It all started on a dark and stormy night. The wind howling and the rain pouring down relentlessly. I was sitting by the fire, enjoying the warmth when I heard a strange noise coming from outside. At first, I thought it was just the wind, but then I started hearing it more often, again and again. And then, what sounded like a low growl. That made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I looked out the window, but couldn't see anything in the darkness. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. Then I heard another noise, a scratching sound like something was trying to claw its way inside. I went to the door and peered through the peephole. All I could see was darkness. I cracked the door and shone my flashlight outside, but there was nothing there. I was
was about to close the door and return to bed when I heard a loud bang, like something had hit the roof. I looked up, and to my horror, I saw a pair of glowing eyes staring back at me. I slammed the door shut and locked it, but I knew this wouldn't hold whatever was out there for very long. It kept scratching and clawing at the door, desperately trying to get inside. The sound was so loud and terrifying that I thought the door would break at any second. I huddled by the fire, praying for whatever was outside to disappear, but it didn't. Instead, it kept scratching and clawing, and I could hear its growls getting louder and more aggressive. It felt like hours had passed, but the creature outside never gave up. I was too scared to sleep, too scared to move, too scared to even call for help. Finally, the sun rose and the creature disappeared. I ventured outside and saw that the roof had been damaged with claw marks all over the door. I knew I couldn't stay in that cabin any longer, so I packed my things and left, never looking back. Now, whenever I hear a strange noise at night, I can't help but remember that terrifying night in that isolated cabin. Now let's move on to another story. I was driving down an empty stretch of road in the middle of nowhere. The sun had set hours ago, and the darkness was all-encompassing. The only light came from the headlights of my car, illuminating the road ahead. I had been driving for hours, and the scenery had not changed much at all. It was desolate and barren, with no signs of life for miles around. But for some reason, I couldn't shake this sense of unease. I was not alone on this road. Suddenly, I saw something looming in the distance. I woke up instantly, and my heart began to race. It was like a natural adrenaline rush. It looked like there was a figure walking towards me in the middle of the road. As I got closer, I could see that it was a man dressed in tattered clothes wild look in his eyes. I tried to swerve around him, but he jumped in front of my car, causing me to slam on my brakes. He stood there, staring at me through the windshield, and I could see that his eyes were bloodshot, and his face was twisted into a sinister grin. I tried to back up, but my car was stuck. I was trapped alone, with this deranged man in the middle of nowhere. He started to walk towards me, his pace slow and deliberate, his breathing ragged and heavy. I locked the doors and rolled up the windows, but I knew it was useless. He was getting closer, and I could see him now. His skin was mottled and gray, his hair unkempt and greasy. Suddenly, he lunged at my car, pounding his fists on the window and screaming. I could hear his nails scratching against the glass, and I knew he wanted to break in. I tried to start the car, but it just wouldn't budge. I was trapped with this madman closing in on me. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, my breath coming in short gasps. Just when I thought it was all over, the man, for whatever reason, stopped. He looked at me with those bloodshot eyes then turned and walked away, disappearing into the darkness. Only then did I notice that there was another car coming down the road. I guess I was so focused on this man that I didn't notice them. I got out of my car and instantly flagged them down. They helped me get my car turned around, and eventually I drove home. I can't tell you how it felt in that moment. It felt like I was helpless. And if this car just hadn't happened to be driving down the road, I would have been dead. It's honestly a relief that it worked out this way. But I don't know if other people in the future would be so lucky. Now let's move on to another story. I recently heard about a new trail that promised breathtaking views, so I knew I had to check it out. But little did I know that what I would find would leave me scarred for the rest of my life. I 
eagerly set out on the new hiking trail that promised amazing views and beautiful scenery. But what I found was beyond anything I could have imagined. The forest began innocently enough, winding through the trees and up the mountainside. But as I hiked deeper into the forest, I noticed something strange. Tied to the trees along the trail were animal carcasses rotting in the sun. At first, I thought it was just a few unlucky animals that had died in the wild. But then I saw more and more, all tied up with twine in the same fashion. The smell of death and decay in the air was overwhelming. It was thick and it was making me want to gag. The putrid smell is something that you can't explain unless you've been around a lot of dead animals. As I continued down the trail, the number of animal carcasses increased, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was beginning to stalk me. Every rustle of the leaves made me jump, and I could feel my heart pounding in my ears. Trail and go back down that nightmare. When I finally returned to the trailhead, I collapsed on the ground, gasping for air. The image of those animal carcasses tied to the trees like some twisted offering, would forever be seared into my mind. The thought that someone or something was out there, watching me, hunting me, still haunts me. I reported all of this to the police, but I'm not sure whatever came of it. Now, let's move on to another weird occurrence I had. I was a teenager, maybe about 15 or 16 years old, in the mid-2000s. I spent most of my early to late teenage years in a small town called Cresco in Iowa. Let me set the scene for the story. I woke up early one Sunday morning. While it was still dark out, around five o'clock in the morning, to prepare for my paper route job, I got all my stuff ready and into my courier bag, ready to set out for my route, leaving my house to start my career. Once I left my house, I started walking down the sidewalk to the corner of the intersection, the cross street to get to the next road heading north. I had to pass a large three-story building that I believe used to be an old school at one point, but was now just used for storage for the fitness center that was right next door. I had a weird feeling that something was wrong I looked over the opening of the alleyway and saw the most bizarre and creepiest thing ever. Underneath the lamppost, illuminated by the light, was a puddle of darkness. I had no idea what it was. I knew it wasn't water. It moved and rippled like it, but it just wasn't. I stared at it for a few minutes and decided, nope, not today, and just walked the on the opposite way back to my job. I returned an hour later, while it was still dark out, and it was not there anymore. So what the heck was it? A figment of my imagination? A doorway to hell? Or something from another world? I don't know. CCO has had strange and messed up stuff happen, and there are definitely bouts of weirdness going on in that small town on a daily basis. I'm just looking to find answers about it. I once asked a self-proclaimed paranormal investigator about it, and they said it was probably a doorway or something to some sort of other dimension, or possibly just a creature. Halloween 4 by Anonymous. I grew up in Rue, Iowa, just cornfields for miles and miles. It was a pretty crappy place to grow up, but it'll always be home to me, and I'll always have a fair amount of affection for it. But as they say, home is where the heart is, and all that BS. Even in the earliest stage of life that I can remember, I wanted to put it this way. Halloween has always been my favorite holiday, but unlike the kids who trick-or-treat in Cedar Rapids or Waterloo, who had actual neighborhoods to harvest whole sacks of candy from. 
we had to walk about a mile and a half at a time just to make it to the next house. So, aside from the one year when our mom drove us over to Dyer's, where we got a taste of how those city kids lived, trick-or-treating wasn't really an option for us. So, a little backstory. Last year, we were allowed to go trick-or-treating. Our immediate neighbor to the east, who lives three miles away, told us to go to hell because we were getting way too big for playing kids' games. This guy had begrudgingly given us a few apples some years in the past, and we always resented it. But that year, when he told us where to go, it made us downright hate him. I mean, the entirety of the following year, my brother and I would scowl whenever my dad drove past his house. To us, he had ruined the one good thing we got to do around Halloween each year. I know we were just dumb kids, but kids are also cruel and stubborn occasionally. And I guess we were just that kind of kids. So the following year, my mom decided to take us over to the Living History Farms in Urbandale. The Living History Farms is a place near Des Moines that positions itself as an interactive outdoor museum aimed at educating people about the rural life experience in the Midwest. To be honest, my brother and I weren't really thrilled about the visit. It wasn't exactly exciting for two boys in their early teens. Learning about some of the origins of Halloween was pretty cool, especially for a kid like me, who was all about hearing how Halloween was the night when the spirits of the dead returned to Earth to wreak havoc on those who had wronged them in life. However, there was one particular educational tidbit that caught my brothers and my attention. That was how our lone ancestors used Halloween as a night to play pranks on each other. Pulling up cabbages and shrubs out of their gardens was a common trick. Wagons were pushed into the lane or the street. If the kids were ambitious, they'd hoist the cars of the victim onto their barn roof. But the most common mischief was taking your neighbor's garden or barn gates off the hinges and leaving them in someone else's yard. I remember the teacher lady telling us this, and my brother and I just looked at each other with a wordless kind of communication that said, our neighbor is going to get it this year. So that year, we snuck out of the house in the early morning hours, walked down to the neighbor's place with a screwdriver and a hammer. And we did exactly that. We took his front gate off the hinges, walked about a mile down the road to his neighbor's place, and left it in their front yard. We continued doing stuff like that for the next couple of years, each time getting progressively bolder and messing with him harder and harder. It got to the point where we struggled to top the previous year's prank. And eventually, it got to the point where we stole a considerable section of his white picket fence and just threw it into the cornfield across the highway. We put some work into dismantling it piece by piece so as not to make much noise and wake the guy up. It sucked that we never got to hang around to see his reaction but just imagining him going outside in the morning and going insane with rage was enough to keep us amused. So, this one year, we walked up to his house in the middle of the night and saw something we had never experienced in a million years. This neighbor, he hated Halloween and never put up any decorations or anything. But that year, when we turned up, we saw a grim reaper on his front porch. It wasn't just some dumb-looking scarecrow-type thing. It seemed like the guy had put in a lot of work, using actual mannequins and spooky-looking black robe stuff to dress it up. Since he was a farmer, he didn't have much trouble getting an old, rusty scythe to lean against it. It was kind of intimidating, and we figured he had only put it there to try to scare us off. 
but we weren't about to be deterred from our yearly ritual at this point. Nothing short of a tornado could stop us from getting our revenge for how mean he had been to us that Halloween night. As we started to dismantle his fence in almost absolute silence, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Or rather, I noticed the lack of something. It was so subtle that it took me a minute to realize what I wasn't looking at. At some point, as we were taking his fence apart, the Grim Reaper statue thing just stood up and disappeared. I stopped what I was doing, looking around the front yard, trying to spot where it could have gone. I whispered to my brother, did you see it move? At first, he looked at me like I was crazy, but then he too started to break down. We crouched down, tools in hand, in dead silence of the night, realizing that we had been a little too overconfident in our yearly pranks. We didn't quite understand what was happening. That's when things went wrong for us. Let's get out of here, my brother whispered, and we immediately got up and started jogging back towards the highway. But out of nowhere, the Grim Reaper was standing in front of us with that giant old rusty scythe in his hand blocking our escape. It hadn't been a mannequin set up on the front porch. It was actually him. He had dressed up like some dumb decoration and just stood there, still as a statue, waiting for the pranksters to arrive. There was one drawn out moment when we locked eyes with the guy who had taken down the hood and black robes he was wearing. Then we just bolted but since he was blocking the way and the road out front, we had to run back through his property, climbing over a fence and into a cornfield that seemed to awaken him. He was fast for an older guy. Maybe it was all the anger from being victimized year after year, but somehow he wasn't weighed down by the scythe and those robes. For whatever reason, he kept on chasing us, and it didn't slow him down at all. I was scared, sure, but I figured we'd be able to get away. But remember how I said the scale of the fence to get away? Hopping down the other side didn't go well for me. I badly sprained my ankle when I landed. That's when I got terrified, realizing I couldn't get away from the guy. My brother kept running, and I wanted to shout after him for help. But I knew that shouting would give away my position to the guy, so I kept my mouth shut. So, picture this. I'm hiding in the cornfield, so scared that I'm covering my mouth to keep from breathing too heavily, while the furious scythe-armed guy is stalking up and down the road, looking for me. Every so often, I had to limp to a hiding spot further down away from him trying my best not to rustle any of the stalks so I wouldn't betray my hiding spot. It was the middle of the night, and maybe the guy's eyesight or hearing was failing him, but I managed not to get myself caught. I kept stumbling further and further away until he gave up and headed back to his house. This was completely and utterly terrifying. Hearing him say, step back, the tone of his voice was telling me he meant every word of it. So, yeah, as you can imagine, I was pretty close to panicking many times, knowing that I just couldn't get away fast enough. Needless to say, we didn't try any more pranks on that guy after that. Now, as for my hometown's sinister secret, I grew up in a small town in East Central Iowa. At first glance, isn't much to see. It has only one stoplight on its main road. The downtown area is along the main street and is lined with old buildings from the 1940s. There's a Carnegie Library on the south side of town, and to the west, you'll find the fairgrounds and the dirt track. As for the things it's known for, the town doesn't have much. 
a fantastic county fair that brings in people from all over the state and a special cream treat of pastry that keeps visitors and townsfolk happy. But that's not why you're here. You want to know about the dark and scary things that have happened in my hometown's past. For any music lovers, you may be saddened to hear that Buddy Holly and his band had their last meal in my hometown. They had dinner at a diner called the Greasy Spoon before driving north and making their fateful flight into history. My grandmother lived in that town nearly all her life and said that particular diner was a horrible place and went out of business decades ago. This bit of history is pretty well known among the older population and to those who like to study their town's history. But there is one more thing that is not nearly as well known. If you were to travel to the northwest side of town, you'd find lots of sprawling cornfields and a few old farmhouses dotted around the area. But in the middle of the old cornfield, sitting away from all the other buildings, stands a tall brick building called the Old Cedar County Home. The county home was built in the early 1900s as a poor farm for those less fortunate to have a place to stay and work. However, not everybody liked this idea. And on opening day, one of the head staff members was attacked by a resident with a pitchfork the records I've looked through have yet to say whether the poor staff member survived this attack. Later, around the 1930s, the building gained an addition in the form of a mental asylum, which soon took its first patients. This particular time was a rough period for everybody in history, and the home's occupants continued to grow into World War II began. After the war, the farm side of the house began to diminish, while the mental hospital, now called an insane asylum, continued to grow. It was at this time that its most atrocious happenings took place. The head nurse of the asylum didn't like her patients very much, especially the insane women who either were or happened to become pregnant while there. The story goes that the nurse would be quite cruel to the pregnant women, making them work outside or do extra chores, even though they could barely stand. When it came time to give birth, the nurse would drug the mother so severely that they would be unconscious. As soon as the baby was born, the nurse would take the baby away and kill it, later telling the mothers that their baby was still born. The nurse was let go after a while, and the home began to fall into hard times. Sometime around 2004, when its last residents were transferred elsewhere, this place was finally closed. A farmer bought the house and the full land, but they still stand as a reminder of their cruel past. The locals who do know about it say that it is probably a drug den now, and most agree that it's undoubtedly haunted. As the home is on private property, exploring the remains of the building is challenging unless you want to risk getting arrested or shot at. However, some people have found a way in and shared photos online. Most of them aren't too scary, except for one that caught my attention immediately. The words, I see you, were spray painted in black. The future of the home is uncertain, as the farmer uses the land for storage and has left this place in particular untouched all these years. But one thing is clear, you'll never catch me going near that place in small town Iowa. On a map, my county consists of a tight cluster of small towns, each with a seemingly unique niche of people but it's all just the same picture in a different frame. All right, with that out of the way, let's get to it. I'll try to keep this brief, but there's a lot of ground to cover here. All right, so a buddy of mine, let's call him Dumbo, wound up with his first girlfriend in one of these small towns. Later on, he broke it off 
and moved to where he currently lives. In seventh grade, the two towns are about an hour's drive apart. Fast forward a couple of years to our junior year in high school. At this point, Dumbo and I are 16, and he's been through a couple of girls, but won't stop talking about his first girlfriend back in sixth grade. In due time, they get back together, and him driving over to this other small town every Friday becomes regular. He stays a little later every time and eventually starts spending the night there. On a Thursday evening, we learn we won't be having school the following Friday. Dumbo and I stay up too late screwing around on video games, and he heads out at about 2 a.m. He shoots me a text shortly after, saying one of his girlfriend's friends needs a date. As a complete geek, I snap at the opportunity, and we head to this small town the following morning. Long story short, it was the most disastrous six hours I had in a long time. I'll spare a lot of the details, so fast forward a few months. Dumbo has since broken up with his girlfriend for unexpected reasons. Apparently, she was frequently FaceTiming him, always drawing a blank. She would call him almost every couple of hours, and I'm told she went berserk when he didn't pick up, leaving many voicemails and tons of angry texts. She had picked up a fascination with Twilight in recent times as well, and that translated a little too much into her real life. Despite this, Dumbo didn't break it off until November of 2014. After the breakup, she still texts him, saying how she'll wait for him and all that good stuff. Now remember that girl I was set up with? She was apparently a bit too physical with Dumbo's girlfriend's sister, not even just roughing her up. Uh. Here's the improved version of the text with better paragraph structure, punctuation, and sentence clarity. To go to court for a restraining order case, Dumbo still gets texts from Miss Chip. I'm told the girl I was set up with misses me, which gives me shivers. This is pretty outlandish and nearly unbelievable, but it's all entirely true. Some people are absolutely insane, and you should be very careful who you set your friends up with, especially if you don't know who they are. Always carry a weapon, anonymous. I like to run outside, and I usually have a knife with me just in case. I started doing that after they found Molly's body in Iowa. The runner who was murdered a couple of years ago, living in the state, it really put me on edge. Well, one day I was in a bad mood, so I went for a walk and didn't think to bring my knife with me. Of course, this was the one time someone tried to bother me. The setting is a sidewalk between an open field and some apartment buildings. I was walking with my earbuds in, listening to music, and I took a lap. I walked a little way down the path and then decided to turn around and go back. When I turned, I saw a man walking towards me. Not that unusual, I guess. As I do live in a rather decent-sized town in Iowa. But being on a sidewalk and all, I thought, okay, whatever, just a pedestrian. I prepared myself for that awkward smile, say hi, and walk by. However, as I tried to get around him, I noticed he was trying to talk to me and was getting in my way of going around him. I glanced and then tried to ignore him, but he walked back to catch up with me. Annoyed, I removed one earbud, and he was rambling about how he wanted to know where I lived, what my name was, and other personal stuff. I just pointed in a random direction away from my apartment and lied about my name while picking my face. Then the guy asked if I was seeing anyone. I said, yes, I'm married. And then he started carrying on about how he was sorry and how he didn't want to get in the middle of anything. Sure, because I would leave my husband for some random weirdo in the street. Suddenly, a girl from the... Suddenly, a girl from the apartment building across the street shouted at me and waved her arms, 
so I ran towards her. The guy hopped in his car, turned around, and I assumed he was driving by, but he pulled over to follow me. She asked if he was bothering me, and I said yes. I thanked her. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't. I don't know what would have happened if he tried to go beyond this level of creepiness. But I'm a lot more cautious now, and I never forget myself. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true small town horror stories that will freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to hit that like button like it owes you money. Every like helps this video grow and be seen. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode. I upload them multiple times every week on everything natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, whether it's from a small towns or something else, be sure to submit it at swamp.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. And stories like yours help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go and don't have YouTube premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite swamp core scary stories, no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcasts online. It's absolutely freaky, always will be. I'd love to know in the comments down below which story is your favorite tonight. I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode. For, I hope you enjoyed the spine chilling stories from tonight. Always remember to stay cautious and vigilant, especially if you live in a small town or anywhere else. If you have a story you'd like to share in future episodes, whether it's about small towns or anything else, please don't hesitate to send it to swamp.net or the email address you can find in the description below the video. Your stories mean a lot to us and they help keep this show running. Thank you for your support. If you want to continue listening to our creepy stories, you can download them for free from various podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Be a part of this community that's always seeking spine-tingling tales. See you in the next episode, where we'll once again immerse you in the world of chilling stories. Take care and stay vigilant. Thank you for being a part of Swamp Queer. <laughs>